Last time I characterized Descartes as, in a sense, beginning the philosophical issue known as the mind-body problem. In some ways that's right, because he's the first person to really directly tackle the question of the relation between mind and body, and to advance dualism as the solution to the problem raised there, that mind and body are distinct and separable. But he's not really the first person who recognizes it as a serious philosophical problem. That honor, I think, goes to Princess Elizabeth of Bohemia. She was one of the greatest intellects of the 17th century. She was slated to become the Queen of Bohemia, but then a variety of unfortunate things happened. She ended up spending much of her life as an abbess, running an abbey, and she conducted a correspondence over some years with Descartes about philosophy and a variety of other topics. Those letters are really quite interesting, and she poses a number of challenges to his ideas on ethics, but also what I want to talk about here, to his ideas about dualism, about the separation of mind and body. She's skeptical about his claims there, skeptical about the arguments, and you might say she's really the first person who sees this question of mind and body as a real philosophical problem, as opposed to simply a question to which one might provide a certain kind of answer, as Descartes provides dualism as an answer. So I want to examine her criticisms. They seem to me still very serious criticisms that we ought to focus on and take seriously. As these images of her suggest, she was somebody who was a vibrant young woman, thought to be the most eligible, well, woman in royalty in Europe at the time. She was also a noted classicist and established an intellectual reputation for her knowledge of the classics and for her knowledge of philosophy. She attacks Descartes' dualism. We talked about that in a separate video, but I want to remind you, dualism is the view that mind and body are distinct. They are separate, they are independent of one another. I am not my body. My mind and my body are distinct. I am in my body as something like a pilot in a vessel, in something like the way that a sailor is in a ship. And so Descartes gives an argument. He says, I'm a thing that thinks, in fact, essentially a thing that thinks. My body is not essentially a thing that thinks, so I'm not my body. Well, if I am not my body, I do need to say something about why I seem to be so intimately connected to my body. I could doubt the existence of wax and candles and other various things around me. I can't doubt the existence of my hands and other things about my body quite as easily. Now, I could doubt them. I can imagine I'm a brain, or not even a brain, some kind of immaterial soul that simply seems to myself to have a body. I could be deceived about all that. But that seems like a much further stretch. Uh, in my dreams, I still have a body, even though I might not actually have contact with things that really exist in the world. And so I need to explain that feeling of unity. My mind says, raise your hand, and immediately it obeys. Augustine gives that example, and that's something that seems intimate about the link between mind and body. So they do seem to be intermingled. There is a union and apparent intermingling of mind and body, as Descartes puts it. We need to explain that. If they're distinct, why do they seem so deeply connected? I'm a thing that thinks, but I do have a body. How does that mind relate to the body and relate to it in such a way that they have this union and apparent intermingling? How is that possible? There are really two dimensions to the problem that Princess Elizabeth isolates. That mind-body connection goes both ways. So there is the problem of how the body is able to affect the mind. That's essentially the problem of sensation or perception. How is it possible for my eye, for example, to see something and then for my mind to register an image of what I'm seeing? And how is it possible for my mind to direct my body? That's the issue of mental causation. I say, rise arm, and it rises. How is that possible? So I have to think about both of those dimensions. Let's turn first to sensation. How does the body affect the mind? I bump into something, my leg hurts. That sensation of pain is transferred from my body to my mind. How is that possible if they're separate entities? So here's Princess Elizabeth's way of framing the problem. I ask you to tell me how man's soul, being only a thinking substance, can determine animal spirits, so as to cause voluntary actions. How is it possible for me to, an immaterial me, remember I'm a thinking, unextended thing, to say, rise hand, and have my hand rise? How is my spirit able to control my flesh in this way? Well, <laughs> it doesn't always obey, of course. The mind-body problem. Get up, 
No. Uh, yeah, but in general it does. Usually I succeed in getting my mental actions, like my intentions, to actually issue in bodily motion. There's another dimension to this problem. Causes have to be extended in space. I know what causes something physical to move. It's generally something physical. Right? It's that kind of thing. Usually things move in space because they contact another object that is moving them. And so usually motion happens because of things happening in space. But wait a minute, mental acts like an intention to move my hand. That's not something that's extended in space. And we just have no theory that explains how something that is not in space, that is not extended, can move something extended that is in space. We have a theory, namely physics, about how things that are physical move in space. But how can something outside of space move something in space? We have no understanding of that at all. We have no theory that tells us how that's even possible. It's even worse. Because actually, the fact that we do have a theory about how things in space move other things in space creates a problem. It's a problem sometimes known as the problem of the completeness of physics. How can a mental act, like an intention, cause a bodily motion? Well, we have a theory about what causes bodily motions. That theory is physics. It tells us how things move other things in space. Physics portrays the universe as causally closed. What moves objects in space? Other objects in space that move them. So it looks like if I say, well, wait, my hand moved because of my intention to move it, I've got too many causes. Doesn't physics already explain motion? What more could there be? And now you say, well, there's the physics part, but also the intention to move my arm. Well, uh, how does that work? The physics is already explaining the motion. What's left for my mental talk to actually explain? It looks like I'm going to have too many causes. And these mental ones turn out to be odiose. They don't do anything. So that seems a problem. Well, Descartes answers Princess Elizabeth in a rather puzzling way. He says, we perceive the interaction of mind and body. The union of mind and body is known very clearly by the senses. But it seems like that misses the point. She's saying, how is that possible? I realize it's possible. That is to say, I know I sense things, that things happen to my body and my mind responds. I know that I form mental intentions to move and I move. So the issue is not whether this is possible. Yes, of course it's possible. It happens all the time. The question is, how is it possible? What makes it possible? If these two things are really separate and distinct, if I am not my body and my mind is not my body, and in fact they're so distinct they're separable from one another, how do they interact in this way? I need a theory that explains mind-body interaction, and I don't have one. In fact, I have a theory about what does move the body, and it's physics, and it doesn't leave any room for the mind. So I don't understand how this is possible. I'm not denying it's possible, she in effect says. Look, don't tell me it's possible. I know it's possible. It happens all the time. I'm asking you how it's possible. How in particular on your theory we can explain how it's possible. So that brings us to the question of how to solve that problem. How do we solve the mind-body problem and understand the relationship between mind and body in such a way that we do explain how things that happen to my body can affect my mind, how I can feel pain, for example, or I, how I can see the color yellow, or conversely, how things that happen in my mind can affect my body, how it is possible for me to direct my arm to move. Well, dualism is Descartes' answer. The physical and the mental are separate. They are distinct. They are independent. They differ in kind. But then I've got this serious problem of interaction, as Princess Elizabeth points out. Then how do they connect? How can I sense anything? How can I direct my body to move? I at least need an explanation. Notice she's not giving an argument that it is impossible. She is simply saying, I don't understand how on this view it can work or how we could have a theory of it. But there are other possibilities. I do seem to say, well, okay, look, <laughs> if I'm Descartes, they do interact. But could Descartes go beyond that sort of question-begging answer? Maybe he can. He could say, you're asking me to give you a scientific theory of perception of how the body affects the mind and also of mental causation, how things happening in my mind affect the body. How does that happen? It requires scientific investigation. Even today, we're really at the beginnings of understanding neurophysiology, understanding how the brain works to interact with the body, how it receives information, how it transmits commands to the muscles and other parts of the body. This is all still in primitive form. In the 17th century, nobody had a clue, didn't even know that it was the brain, really, that was doing all of this. In any case, here's one possibility. 
to say it's a question for scientific investigation. How does it happen? I don't know how it happens, but eventually neurophysiologists will figure it out. Ask the neuroscientist. And they may not be able to tell you today, but sooner or later they'll be able to tell you. That's one answer. Another answer given at the time of Descartes and Princess Elizabeth was, was occasionalism. That is to say, God is the only true cause. And God is something like the conductor of the universe. So actually, mind is not affecting body, and body isn't affecting mind. It's more like the conductor saying, now, mind and body together. Just as the conductor says, OK, violins and trumpets come in here together and directs them so God is conducting the universe. So thought and motion go together. Slap on the thigh, feeling of pain, or sensation of yellow in the eye, perception of yellow in the mind. God is doing all of that as a grand conductor of the universe. Leibniz had a different idea. Maybe God is coordinating from the beginning two causal chains. God is in effect creating two universes, a mental universe and a physical universe, and winds up the universes in such a way that they match all the way through. So one isn't really interacting with the other, they just happen to match, like two clocks that were set to the same time and allowed to run. We could be monists. We could say, ah, look, there isn't really a separation between mind and body. Maybe everything is really mind. That's the idealist perspective. Maybe everything is really body. That's the physicalist perspective. Neutral monism, adopted by, I think, Zen Buddhism, but also by Bertrand Russell at a certain stage of his thought, says, well, everything's really something. Really, mind is this something, and physics, uh, you know, body is really this something. That's the same something, and the, all the interaction goes on down there, but I don't know what that something is, and maybe, in principle, we can't know what that something is. So if we are materialists, if we say with the physicalist or materialist, everything is really material, the mental is really physical, we still have some explaining to do. We have to say, well, what kind of physical thing is a mental thing? How do we explain our talk about thoughts, intentions, desires, and so forth? You're saying, well, in the end, that has something to do with my, the material state of my body. Well, what? How does that work? There's still a lot of explaining to do. Similarly, if an, uh, as an idealist I say, well, really, the physical is just some special kind or dimension of the mental, well, I still have to do a lot of explaining of how those two relate and then how it seems to me there's a physical world, how it seems to me that things are extended in space and time and resist my desires and intentions as often as they give in to them. If I'm a neutral monist, it seems like I'm really in a position of mystery. They're both of the same kind. What is that kind? Something I know not what. I don't know how to answer that question. There are other possibilities that contemporary philosophers of mind have investigated. So you could be an epiphenomenalist who says, well, the mental just seems to be there. It's not really there. It's just a byproduct of the physical interaction. You could hold double aspect theory, as Spinoza does, saying that actually it's one thing, but there are two aspects of it. Really, that's something like that neutral monus view. You could be somebody who thinks that there is pre-established harmony, like Leibniz, or you could be an occasionalist, God is the conductor of the universe, like Malbranche, or you could think these things simply run in parallel somehow, and you're not quite so fanciful as to say God is conducting it all or pre-established it, but that looks like we still don't have any explanation for the parallelism. So in short, Princess Elizabeth is raising a hard series of questions for Descartes. But it's not just a hard series of questions for Descartes. It's a hard series of questions for anybody in thinking about the relationship between mind and body. And no matter what view you adopt, there is no easy answer. You've still got a very difficult problem of explanation that you have to address.